All right, so we're going uh, over chapter three, mastering the grammar. Um, one thing, if you look at the book over here, um, this is the introduction to this section, right? So um, it is kind of an introductory um, chapter. And so the next one to build a pot layer by layer kind of gets into some of these separate parts of the grammar in more detail. And so this sort of is a transition in the book from these sort of more um, kind of high level things, you know, maps, annotations, et cetera, and, and kind of going back to where sort of the book starts above of the, the grammar of graphics and sort of the theory behind it or philosophy behind it. Uh, the, the learning objectives are uh, review the elements and benefits of the grammar of graphics. Uh, be able to break down simple graphics into its component parts. So it's kind of the benefit of having the grammar is to be able to look at a graph and kind of break it down into what you're seeing or to be able to start your own development of a visualization instead of just being like really iterative and being like, oh, I'm going to do a bar chart, then a cluster bar chart, then a line chart, having, hopefully having like a more, uh, a better process for how you know what you're going for and how you're setting that up before you get to some of those specifics uh there's sections on mapping coordinates define and identify layer and scaling as well as coordinate and faceting i don't i kind of like skip faceting a little bit here but we've got a little bit on scaling and coordinates um create a process for integrating the grammar into your visual design so that's kind of what i was just saying about like a process talking about like if you're given what we understand about the grammar of graphics how does that actually affect what we do, um, if, if at all. Um, and then the final part is applying the grammar to analysis of existing graphics. I do have this link. There is um, this Hadley Wickham um, article. Basically, chapter 13 does sort of like distill this longer article. So there's a little, and I did kind of read through this and, and added some of the some of the charts from this, but that's that's a you know resource if you're wanting to dig in more. Uh, as far as this last point, applying the grammar to uh, the analysis of existing graphics. So the book does give seven examples, including like Napoleon's March, which I wasn't necessarily super interested in reviewing, as you maybe have already heard of that. Um, and there's just some you know some art visuals in New York Times and some different places that were fine, but I. Um, I was kind of inspired by this, uh, our 51 best and weirdest charts of 2021. So I thought after I kind of go through some of these points, we could look at some of these charts and maybe break it down via the grammar. Um, so there's like a sports one on chess where it goes, I'll give like a very brief introduction here. we got a sports one on chess where it kind of goes over essentially where the, you know, like this person was kind of losing the chess mass match and then eventually they, you know, was winning and eventually they lost it kind of so it sort of shows the progression of the chess match over time um you know there's some pretty standard kind of waffle charts but this was most negative neutral most positive so it's almost like a likert scale and then you're breaking down this proportionality within each section of that scale uh and we got some sports kind of things as well uh which have like some things like positioning uh f your physical positioning out of court um, things like that so um, those are some we'll maybe take a look at here. Uh, so moving on, we get, all right, a couple, let me get this out of my way. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, a definition of grammar is the fundamental principles or rules of an art or science. Uh, in order to unlock the power of ggplot2, you'll need to master the underlying grammar. Uh, by understanding the grammar and how its components fit together, you can create a wider range of visualization, combining multiple sources of data and customize to your heart's content. I thought this was interesting, you know, sort of wider range. So it's not, you know, just have you know, a handful of common chart, chart types, but you can have a wider range of options at your disposal. Um, I thought that was interesting, like multiple sources of data. You know, so I mean, a, a, an example earlier, there was like a from the annotations chapter where there was um, some trending data, and then you mapped a different data set which had who was president at the time of the trends by color, and so that sort of added like a different data set 
and added a different element to the chart that wasn't there. Anyways, I thought that was interesting. Um, again, the next chapters kind of dig more into it. Um, there's, let's see. So it's four parts of a layer. And so the data and aesthetic mapping, uh, statistical transformation, a geome and position adjustment would be the four parts. So we have a key point. So, um, you know, ge ge uh, geometric op uh, objects are things like points and lines, and then aesthetic mappings are things like your size, color, and shape. Um, or an important aesthetic mapping is uh, location as well. So benefits of using the grammar um, allows one to iterate in the creation of or updating of a plot, uh, gives a language for viewing and learning from existing data viz, and enables a better process by focusing the developer on the intended purpose of the visual. Again, not just matching a chart to data right away. And expands data viz beyond just how to use this particular software syntax. If, so on the one hand, like the theory of the grammar of graphics would expand beyond R. You know, if you use other visualizations tools, I, I use Power BI, for example, but even within R, it could, it kind of expands the study of visualization beyond like just having cookbooks, uh, a cookbook of, of a certain kind of visualization, which is, which is fine, but you know, so it, again, kind of instead of just having like a certain syntax to create certain charts, thinking kind of hopefully a little bit more broadly about what you're wanting to do and having more options for completing a visualization that satisfies what you're wanting to do. Uh, so Bill, the, uh, the book gives a simple example of a scatter plot and these these two are basically showing that, hey, instead of the scatter plot, we can do a line, though it doesn't necessarily improve the situation. Instead of scatter plot, you can use GM bar, but you know, this isn't necessarily good, just in the same way that you can use the English grammar in technically correct ways, but not make any sense. You can certainly do that with um, the grammar of graphics. And that's basically what these two charts are showing. So here, this is a little bit smaller. So here's a chart and the question is what type of graph would you call this? Um, and so obviously we see a sort of scatter plot um, and uh, what we see here is the miles per gallon data set and cylinders are like the cylinders of a car. And so we see individual cars and then on each cylinder for, you know, we don't really have five, much for five, four, six, and eight, uh, then we, the, a trend line was fit. So the question is sort of what, what type of graph would you call this? And then this kind of the related question would be like, how, how would you sort of break this, this graph down? Or what do you think of this? Um, I, I, this is an open question. Yeah, mm -hmm. sorry, yeah, it's open. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I thought that it would just be a scatter plot, and unless there's something else, but I know that scatter plots don't strictly always have those um, that standard error bar or ribbon. Or the trend line, so maybe it's some kind of a hybrid of a of a, a scatter plot and um, something that includes the standard error. Right. Yeah, I think that that makes sense. Yeah, just kind of the is it's a hybrid of a it's basically a couple different layers. Um. So it's similar if you had a scatter plot of just all the data and then you fit a trend line through all the data, it, you know, that's just basically like you're, you're showing 
which is what the original scatter plot kind of does in the in the book. So basically, you're just showing two different layers on the same data. You're showing two different geomes on the same data that gets at uh, just a, a different elements. And, and with uh, with this, you're looking at a, a statistical transformation. Um, <clears throat> you know, whereas the the dots don't have that. Anything else? I kind of think the point of the question is to show that this is not really a kind of out of the box plot that you, you know, you can't just look up, I want a scatter plot, I want the dot plot, whatever that you, you know, I want a scatter plot with trend lines by factor and standard errors on the trend lines. So I think that's kind of the point he's trying to make right. is that you can create things that are more complex than just sort of the standard right. plots. Right. Yeah, I think you're right, for sure. And one thing I thought when looking at this is it's almost like, like if you did facets, you could facet on cylinder, and then you'd have sort of like, you know, this would be one facet and then you have the the teal blue here would be another facet. You'd have another facet for purple. And that would sort of give you the same or a sort of a similar display. But, you know, you might look at this and be like, well, you know, if this wouldn't work if all the, a lot of this data overlapped and maybe facets would work if a lot of this data overlapped. But it, you could kind of like, this is maybe an example where you, you, you look at a graph, you kind of break it down, and then you say, well, maybe, you know, maybe this could be an, an alternative to facets. You know, like maybe, maybe I would have faceted this at one point, but, you know, maybe there's value in having everything on one chart, or you just need to for some practical reason. And so by breaking down this chart, it kind of gives you that insight, whereas that you wouldn't necessarily get to that if you were just mapping it to a standard chart type. So there's a bit about scaling. Uh, one thing is, so, so we look at what we, uh, what we see versus what the computer sees. This quote says the values of the previous table have no meaning to the computer. We need to convert them from data units to graphical units, like pixels is one example there, that the computer can display. This conversion process is called scaling and performed by scales. So we might see colors, but the computer reads hexadecimal string. Uh, we might perceive size, but the computer reads a number and sh the same shapes and integers. Um, and I had this, so this is from the book. I just had this queued up because this is the, the scatter plot. I guess if we go up, we can sort of see this was the um, original scatter plot kind of in question that was used as the basic example. So I wanted to kind of highlight this because this shows there's a scaling on the X and Y axis that is from zero to one. Uh, and the color and hexadecimal, the shape by size and shape by uh, numbers or integers. And so here's an example where you'd have a you know, miles per gallon data frame, and that's in a cer certain, you, know, you can imagine sort of what those, you know, pull up, pull up that, view that data set to kind of see what those variables and numbers look like. But then when you're mapping them and you make those selections, you need to have this conversion to um, to these, to this kind of um, data, and then it's this that is then mapped to actually what you see. And the book also mentions that it's the grid package that converts the zero to one values to to pixels. But I know we had we've had some experience kind of peeking under the hood of what's going on with GG. Plot two when you make selections. This is obviously a very simple look, but you know that kind of just speaks to speaks to scaling and what scaling is doing. 
um, here, I ran some of the code of this. Um, yeah, so here, vignette. So the book kind of mentions if you run this code vignette, quote unquote, ggplot2 dash specs, it'll give you a bunch of information. I've run, I've run some of the code from that vignette here. And it just, this is again, just shows you scaling. So shapes, here's shapes, and you can see that different shapes equate to different uh, integers, that is, equates to certain shapes. Um, and then, you know, you have either, again, integers, you know, one for solid or the actual typing in solid, quote unquote, gives you this solid line. Uh, there's stuff on fonts. There's stuff on horizontal and vertical justification. You know, you see these are numbers that you know, this is an adjustment zero, um, you know, on X axis and one on the Y. So that goes all the way up here. 0.5 and 0.5. So that's just from that vignette. And talks a little bit about coordinate sy systems with chord Cartesian being the default. I thought this was an interesting uh, quote. Coordinate systems affect all position variables simultaneously. Uh, and differ from scales in that they also change the appearance of the geometric objects. Uh, so different coordinate system will change the appearance. Here I took one of the earlier visuals and added chord polar, chord underscore polar. And then, so this was like a bar, bar chart and now it looks like this, which I think looks cool, but whether that is useful or not, I don't know. And here, this is an example from the article. You'll notice this as a pie chart, but why this is included is you know, if you look at the code up here, it's a GM bar plus chord polar. So in the grammar, a pie chart is a stacked bar GM drawn in a polar coordinate system, which you may not necessarily need to, to do it this way, but it just kind of shows you the coordinate system and sort of kind of what's going on under the hood to make a pie chart. And then here, you know, this one is actually very similar, but it says for the bullseye chart, which arises when we map the height to radius instead of angle. And so, bitch, theta y here theta x here, and you get a different chart. Cox comb plot here. Um, and then I thought this was interesting, sort of speaks to defaults. So here's the full ggplot2 specification of the scatter plot of price versus weight. Um, so you'll notice this simple scatter plot, carrot, and so I guess the diamonds data set, right? And so carrot and then price. And um, here, ggplot plus, and then you got go to the layer, and then data equals diamonds, mapping equals. So that's just, okay, so here mapping, that's just, you know, you don't have to do that. So that's a little bit more. Then geom equals point, and then stat equals identity, position equals identity, and then actually specifying the scales, scale y continuous, scale x continuous, and then actually specifying the coordinate system. So this is how, this is sort of what, again, what's going on under the hood. When you do this scatter plot and these, you don't have to make these selection because they're defaults, but kind of understanding how the system works can help you to know, can help you to more fully understand uh, the, the options that you have in, in changing things. All right, so this is my last small part before going to the examples. And I have a analogy, and I don't know if this analogy is way off base, because, um, so the analogy is like when you have in statistics, you're trying to do some sort of st statistical method. You'll, uh, there's, there's, you sometimes see flow charts where it's like, okay, what kind of data do you have? You have you know, discrete data, continuous, et cetera. 
and you kind of follow a flow chart with what kind of data you have. And then from there, you kind of eventually get to what kind of method that you might use, whether that be, you know, linear regression or logistic regression or whatnot. And so the analogy is between that and between, you also see flow charts with, with, uh, with, with visuals, right? And so you say, what kind of data do you have? Okay, you have categorical data. Okay, you need to do a bar plot, that kind of thing. And so the idea is that there's a connection there. And so I was watching uh, this uh, lecture one of the this video series that came out recently. I know a couple of you are in the 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 group, the uh, the book club of the the statistical rethinking book. So I was watching that first video. And, you know, he made this point of like, okay, you've got to have your theoretical estimate, and then you've got to have your scientific causal model, and then you use one and two to build a statistical model. Um, not sure if the simulation um, is relevant to, to, to visual, and then, then you analyze the real So the, the idea is that you don't just sort of like, so otherwise you probably just would jump into like, okay, what's this, what's the statistical model I'm gonna use, potentially using a flow chart. And then you go, let's start analyzing. And so I thought that was a really interesting way of thinking about it. And I wondered if that process was relevant to data visualization and the grammar of graphics. And so that's why I kind of have process of start with a business or research question and purpose then um, I say write out grammar. So I guess you kind of like think about it theoretically of like, well, what are all of my options in terms of the grammar graphics and what would kind of best meet my purpose? And then, and then think through the chart types and geom options and then, you know, dig into it and iterate. I haven't, I mean, the only thing that I've done that's kind of maybe kind of similar to this is when I've needed to do a visualization and I've kind of like, I know some people like a lot of like, data viz books or articles, one of the things that people um, recommend doing is like drawing something out first. And I haven't done that, but I have like kind of like, I, I've known the, the analysis that I'm trying to do. And I've sort of like thought through all potential options. And so I didn't get, so I didn't start working until I, I sort of like mapped through kind of what I wanted so that I have like a, uh, a concrete sort of theoretical idea of what I wanted to accomplish before I went in there and just started, you know, putting visualizations to data. Uh, and I think that process helped me. So I kind of wondered whether one of the takeaways from thinking about the grammar of graphics as opposed to just, you know, cooking up some visuals based on common chart types was that it would create a better process for you. So, um, so I was uh, that was a lot there, but um, any does that analogy make sense to people? Am I off base with that? And any, any other comments about like your data visualization process and the grammar graphics and how that might help that process? I'm, I'm just not really sure what you mean by write out the grammar. Is that like in the, because the, I'm just not sure what you mean by that. Right. Uh, yeah, I guess that was a f confusing way of putting that. I just meant like, I don't know, like that's, I, I, so that would be the equivalent of the scientific causal model here. So it's like basically like think about, um, think about the grammar of graphics. So think about like the layers that, um, that you would want to do. So instead of just thinking, mm -hmm. I want to do this chart type, think about, well, I need, you know, I might need this, um, I might need a line, you know, because I have, I have like chronological data, I might need a line, but I also might need this other thing. And so I might, you know, and kind of thinking about it, that that's kind of what I mean. Yeah, think through the layers, kind of like, what am I, what am I trying to show here? Right. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. And it's nice to know that there is like a formal, like somebody has formalized this to think about it. And it's not just me like kind of going aggro and I work in um, computational biology and there's typically like just so much information. And so it's more of an art and a dance of like, okay, how do I take all this now and put it into a way of like building these layers that actually make sense and that's more visually appealing and that 
this book has definitely helped me with that process of like, um, you can map every aesthetic under the sun, but if it doesn't look visually appealing and it doesn't send the right message, then you're kind of missing the point. But yeah, so definitely like not wasting time and jumping into our studio guns blazing and making every plot under the sun, but like thinking about like how you would, the, the most efficient way to do this. Right. Still, I still feel like a little bit um, tentative about uh, like being creative with the different visualizations. So I tend to fall back towards just some of the standards. Like I ask myself, <clears throat> will a bot, will a bar chart work here? Um, because I know how to make a bar chart and I don't want to like carry myself off into like um, weird rabbit holes of visualizations when <clears throat> thinking that like I'm being really cute by coming up with some some off the wall visualizations when really something simple can work out so um, but having gone through a lot of this these discussions it is making me a little more confident in trying to try a few more things especially if it answers the question that I'm trying to get forward so yeah I think that's behind my question too is like the, that kind of standard method works, right? You know, it, you know, if you have data that fits a bar chart and you use a bar chart, that works, you know? So then, you know, but ideally re reading this book, you know, if I, if I am to understand and believe the statements in this book, there's a better, you know, something better on the horizon. So, but, you know, I, I, I don't necessarily feel like I'm there, but yeah, either, but, you know, it's kind of like, if there, yeah, that, that would be what I would aspire to. One of the things I really like about ggplot is it's easy to explore. You know, I'll tend to start out with something really simple like a scatter plot or a line chart. And, you know, well, it depends. Sometimes I'm doing exploratory, like trying to understand the data myself. And sometimes I'm trying to figure out a way to present something that's complex. But I usually start out with something simple and then figure out, okay, this, what works? And, or doesn't work about it and tweak it or change it. And it's very easy to explore. And, you know, oh, the line chart didn't work. Let's just do a dot chart. Or what if I make this map the size? Is it better to map this factor to size or to color or things or to just facet on the line? Things like that are really easy to, um, to experiment with in ggplot, I think. Um, Kent, I, I have a um, question sort of I wanted to ask. So I, I've been thinking about this a lot. Uh, you know, I've, there have been some exploratory projects that I was part of and, you know, pretty much in the conversation, in, you know, in, in the spirit of this question, conversations that we're having. Um, so since you brought up this example, uh, I was wondering, do you have, like, is it possible uh, for you to maybe share in a, in one of your um I don't know, not, maybe not a, pro, a complete project in detail, but your thought process of how you're saying that, you know, you, you were working on something and then you're exploring and then you, you know, may, maybe how you mm -hmm. think to yourself when you say, okay, I make this chart and then you look at it and then how do you process it? So you, would you be interested in doing such a discussion? Maybe and if you want, you know, maybe we can try and not record it if it's, you know, work project and it should not be shared. Um, yeah, so basically, how that. do you start from, move, go from starting to look at one data and looking at one diagram, or, you know, one visual to evaluating it? Okay, what else do I need? You know, trying different things and then coming to a final conclusion. Okay, this is what I want. So it'll it'll be great exercise for us to look at it like, in an actual work perspective. I think I could do that. Um, I don't, not off the cuff right now. I sure. could pr prepare something maybe for next week. Yeah, that'll be awesome. Like find a, a one or two examples and just talk through. Yeah. Um, okay. Thanks. Maybe, Thank you. Maybe, yeah, this will be really myself helpful. a note so I don't forget. Yeah. All right. Yeah, and I'll ping you again now uh, once to you know set up uh, a, a week when when you're available when you are you know ready if you want to do it this coming week or next week whenever it works for you. I think it would be a great exercise for everybody. And, and others are actually also welcome to, uh, you know, share their experiences. Um, 
you know, Kent is Kent may be doing it formally, but you know, if you want to bring up anything um, in in your work projects or high side projects, you know, talking about your thought process, like you started discussing, Michael, I think I I learn a lot from what people are doing, so I'd love that. Yeah, I think that'd be a really cool follow up. <clears throat> All right. I have a, a separate question if uh, if we're ready to move on to a different question. Mm -hmm. um, this came up when I was putting together um, a Tidy Tuesday for last week. And I got into the point where I'm, I've created the data, whatever, and now I move into the ggplot part. And, um, and I get, um, I get like a lot of questions in my mind about a, a process to go through to make sure that you're getting first the aesthetics and then the geomes and then the scales and then like the theme. And um, I should have pulled this up, but let me, let me pull it up now and I can maybe illustrate better what I'm talking about here. Yeah, okay. So I'm going to share. Okay. So, okay, everybody can see the R studio. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so it was chocolate bars for for last week, right? So this section all does um, pulling the data together. Okay, that's fine. And then we move into the ggplot section, and the aesthetics are pretty straightforward. I know that you can. Like you can put the aesthetics right there within that first GG plot line. And then there's a line for the geome. <clears throat> and then I had a line here for labs or labels, um, which I think ends right here. And what I found myself doing, well, and then there's this one for themes and then scale X continuous, scale Y continuous, and then another geome label, and then another geome point. And what I found myself doing was like, um, like I get this, <clears throat> I would put this, this geome in, okay, fine. And then I started working on the theme. And then I was like, oh, I need to go back and put in labels. And so then I added in like a label section that only included say title and subtitle. And then I was like, okay, well, I want those to be a different font. So let me go back over here to the theme section and now add in some thematic elements for the title and subtitle. Okay, good. And then I moved on to this and I was like, oh, I also need a Y, a scale Y. So I added that in and then I added in the label. And then I was like, oh, well, I wanna change the label theme. So now I'm back over here to themes and adding in label themes. And then I was like, oh, I need a caption. So let me go and put that up here. And I want to, oh, now I want to add in another geome point. And so that comes in all the way here at the end. And so my question uh, is, like, do you have a way that you organize all the different sections of your, of, of ggplot so that like all the geomes come towards the beginning and then you put in labels and you, and you have a, a, like a title section and a subtitle and a caption section and then all the themes come together and then you do scales after that or whatever that question makes sense even though it was really long um i found myself jumping around a lot trying to fill in different parts and so i i didn't know if people had a, a progression that they go through yeah that question made sense to me um and that's the general progression that I use. Um, I tend to break up my code a little bit more just because I'm neurotic and I need, feel like I need to check everything. Um, so like, instead of having just like chocolate plot, I'm guessing is what that is. I would have like plot input, save that as an object. And that's like my final data frame that I won't really um, mess around with too much. And then I'll just push that straight into GG plot. And then I usually do like all my geomes first. And then um, like right after the geomes, all the labels and then scales and then the theme I always put last. And usually like whenever I start a new project, um, I just like a super basic theme and I actually put that, like I write out like theme and then parentheses and I put that in a separate script and I just call that and like I source that in the start of the 
the markdown document. And that way I'm not like writing like panel background, element text, panel back, you know, panel grid or whatever for every plot. I just say plus plot theme and then it just saves me a lot of typing. Um, but yeah, so that's usually how I do it. Like input, geomes, like I guess labels, axes, scales, and then theme is, is last. And I try to keep that in that way. Like um, I really try to like every project I work on now have that same sort of general style. That way I know I can kind of follow the organization. And if I have to add something, I'm not like looking at my code, like, you know, what the hell did I do here? Like, you know, where am I? I felt like, um, okay. And that makes sense. Yeah, I'm pretty similar to, I, I tend to create the data frame separately unless it's just a really quick, um, like a Slack answer or something like that. And then I, I think I usually put scales ahead of labels, but other than that, pretty much the same as what Stan does. I'm not super sophisticated with theming. I I'm tend to just go with like theme minimal and then maybe add a few, few things. Um, I find I use the themes more when I, there's something I want to remove, like the minor grid lines or something like that. Um, I'm not I'm not super sophisticated about presentation aspects like that. Helpful. Thanks. I'm going to give it a try. Um, uh, maybe you want to take consideration that uh, a second geom, a second layer of uh, geom in, in your plot will uh, override the previous geom. So, yeah, so just this if you uh, uh, would be like uh, even visually better for you to, to have all the geoms uh, just following the ggplot function at the beginning and then all the other things. Uh, and just mind that a second geom uh, will override the first one. So if you, I don't, I don't know, for example, you have uh, points and line and you, you might want to to see the points. So you will do the geom line first and then the geom points uh those things and then the scale uh as well the um, even for the colors or just for the axis that would be just right after the geoms the scales x and y and then all the other things and this is um but this is just because uh, all those those things belongs to each other and then you add features to the plot like the title and the thing. Um, and then our one other question I had is, is labs pretty standard? Is that the best option to use for adjusting label information? I like that as opposed to like doing X lab or Y lab or GG title, or I don't even know if there's a GG subtitle. Yeah. I don't know all the options. I've, I've seen them kind of mixed in through different research I've done, but um, yeah, that was my question. Yeah. I think it's less code to just write labs, but I don't know, personal preference, I guess. Okay. That was my question. Thanks. Yeah, it looks like you can add a subtitle to GG title, but not a caption. Like if you want to use a caption, you have to use labs. So I tend to put all the labels in there, the access labels also. Access labels inside of labs? Yeah. Uh, OK. Is it X preference? But yeah, you no, know, you just say X equals. So in your case, you'd say oh. X equals rating given, Y equals reviewer secret ID. Got it. And then you don't need to scale Y discrete at all. There would be other, there might be other reasons to use scale. Right, right. You scale X continuous, you still want for the limits. Yeah. Um, but you 
Should just give the name probably in one place. Got it. I, I don't know if there's a reason to prefer putting it in labs rather than the scale. It's just what I tend to do. Maybe because I always need, the, pretty much always want the label, but don't necessarily need the scale. So I just stick it in labs. Maybe sometimes you use the scale if you want to customize the thing, you want to change it. You can use scale, Y, I don't know, and change the, the type of thing. And then you use the scale, otherwise you use just the, the title for the axis. Yeah. I have a, a question kind of in a, not really related to plottings per se, but like, does anybody else write out the namespace of the function when they write it? Like, um, like would you write ggplot2 dot dot and then geom label? I, I just, I started doing that recently for some projects just because like I found that there's some um, like packages that have the same functions that do like wildly different things like select and filter. But uh, I'm getting like, kind of frustrated with how long it takes for me to type things. I don't know if anybody else has done that or like run into the same issue and been like, I'm never doing this again or. Yeah, no, I, um, I agree with you. I think on the select and filter, I am currently experiencing those issues. So I have to do it, dplyr, colon, colon. But I've never experienced yeah, yeah. that with ggplot2 functions. So I guess that's not what I do, uh, with, okay. with not, not with ggplot2 functions. And um, sort of going back to that, so one of the approaches or uh, one of the solutions that I recently was looking at it is, um, so there are two things. So what you can do is that uh, in R, so if you, so whichever is the last package that is installed in your current work system is what takes the precedence. So if you can make, if you want to ensure that dplyr is always picked up, you, your library's dplyr statement should be the last one. Um, but again, this is not foolproof. The other option is um, using a conflicted package called conflicted. And then you can um, say at, up top in your code saying conflict, there is a function in within conflicted package that says, you're saying um, that which one you tell it that conflict dot something where you mention that select from deep layer is what you want to prefer. Um, so yeah, I, I was recently researching about it, which I want to include in my code as well, because I, uh, I, I somehow was experiencing this issue um, in one of the monthly reports that I'm doing um, since last two, three months. I just set up the code, I think in October, it, it ran fine, November it ran fine. And when I was doing it for December, it started throwing errors and I was like, what is happening? So doing all the dplyr colon colon sort of fixed it. But yeah, like you said, it, it was annoying because some places it works, at some places it doesn't work. For summarize it works, for select and rename it does not work. So that's- Yeah, really so rename I've definitely run into as well. But so, but so even if you specify like which package takes precedence in mm -hmm. order to use like the, the other one, you would still have to do like the namespace, right? That's right. But okay. usually it's the stats package and it, um, I, I, obviously it's not a base, it's not part of base, but I don't know, it's, it's, it gets loaded with, I'm assuming with either tidyverse or something else. Yeah. But if yeah. we are, I think, but most of the times when we are using selector filter or rename, it is with, with deep layer in mind. That's why we are piping all of it. So I, for me, at least in my case, I find that, you know, doing that is going to resolve a lot of my concerns. Okay, yeah, I'll check that out, thanks. Cause I, sure. I usually have to load like one or two bioconductor packages and they each mm -hmm. then load mm -hmm. like, I don't know, somehow like a hundred other packages and like mm -hmm. everybody has conflicts. So yeah. Um, yeah, but just with ggplot, like writing out like ggplot colon colon, there's like so many functions just to create one plot. It's like kind of annoying. <laughs> yeah. It gets really annoying. Yeah, I mean, it looks kind of nice on like, I don't know, like on a script or whatever. And then there's like zero ambiguity, but um, yeah.
if anyone else has any add-ons, I figure we could just skip the uh, looking at a chart thing. But, yeah, no, you had some other examples you wanted to show. We can move to that. What was that? You were uh, you start when you started the discussion. You said there were certain examples you wanted to discuss. Right. Yeah. We could. You know, we could still do that, yeah, um, to, to sort of break it down into its grammar. I think that'd be great. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'll share again. So, So I read this article. So basically what we're seeing here is we're seeing this chess player, uh, the Carl, so the one who won, uh, Orange, is like the better chess player. And so this Nepo person um, was winning and had like a different strategy and it was kind of working out. And then Nepo misses a promising pawn sacrifice and made another mistake and then lost. So this sort of shows the amount of moves on the x-axis and on the y-axis, you know, here's even, so it's sort of who's ahead. And then this is a 16 match, best out of 16 or something like that. Um, or 14. And so here, you know, here's a little kind of faceting, I guess, of each of the matches. So what do we see here in terms of the layers? Um, I think, I don't know, this looks like a pretty basic like geom call or geom bar, and then just a lot of like annotations that are placed kind of manually mm. um i guess as far as like the y-axis scale i feel like that's probably just a factor um i don't know those little pawns or whatever those are i haven't played chess in a really long time so maybe i'm screwing that up but like those little chess pieces um that's kind of i don't know how you i'm not really sure how you would do that in gg plot mm. but if anybody has any ideas, that's really interesting. You would make that just a separate you know, layer and it would just be like a shape. You find a custom shape and then you'd say uh, the aesthetic is like X equals zero, Y equals two and negative two. I don't, I don't think it gets mapped to anything, but anyway. My guess. Yeah, and um, actually to uh, counter to what uh, Stan said earlier, I think this to me looks like more of a line chart, at least the bottom ones, um, in terms of how the game is approaching. Right. It certainly reminds me, mm -hmm. I mean, in sports, you see a lot of like the probability of winning over the course of a game. Yeah, and this in this case, it's kind of the same thing. Yeah, and in this case, negative, I guess there is no negative actually. It's more of, you know, favoring the blue. So one person, one um, participant or one player versus second player. So it's more of more shades of blue mean this, this blue player or what is this guy? I don't know how to call it. Or if, if it's this orange, then Napoleon is winning. Car sorry, Carlson. Carlson. Is getting some points for that and he gets what, half a point, one point. <laughs> I don't know how that counting works, but so this um, it's like at one time point, if you see only one person is supposed to get the time, uh, get the score. Uh, sure, Kent. So, yeah, yes, one, you take your turn. You get the point, and other person does not get it. Basically, that. 
But uh, how does it still end in a draw? Or is it just the line, the even line is a draw line and that's why the annotation makes sense? No, it says Carlson wins as well. Yeah, one, two, three. Uh, yeah. Well, here's the, yeah, here we see the draws. So I think it goes up and down and then eventually lands in the middle. Okay. So maybe, I don't know, my interpretation, I'm thinking my previous one was not so right because game four, it seems Carlson got all the points or I don't know if he was offensive, what those colors mean. Because you only have the colors for four. In game four, you only have orange. In game five, you only have Carlson's, whatever, this blue guy, and Nepo. Um, and then they both draw. Even then, they both draw. So only one person is getting points. Is that right. based on what my previous assumption was? So I'm not sure. I think it's going off of like uh, probability of winning. Hmm. So in game four, Carlson was making all the right moves and had the greatest probability of winning, but still only hmm. came up with a draw. Okay. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. 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 So it says something in the top. Uh, the race for world chess advantage by player after each move. So yeah. So that x-axis. So this is definitely a timeline thing. Um, after every move. So thirty moves is. Um. So most of the games. So game one to five, they've mostly ended before 50. Game six has gone 100 plus point, uh, 100 plus moves. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, this is a good one to look at. It takes so much time to understand this visual. <laughs> I don't actually play chess, but it's interesting that this visual comes up because I'm now... Um, I'm listening to Nate Silver's book, the audio, um, well, the audio book, um, The Signal and the Noise. And he, one of the chapters he was talking about um, the chess game where like, I forgot like the grandmaster's name, but it, like this guy who's going up against like the computers, once computers were finally like smart enough to beat humans at chess. And it was interesting because yeah, they are talking a lot about the probability, how many moves that are possible to be made at the start of a game. And then as the game goes on, there's less and less um, moves that can be made and stuff. So it's interesting. So, yeah. I, I don't yeah I don't really understand chess either but yeah this is good kind of faceting maybe it is like relatively standard or at least relative for this kind of a problem in terms of um, probabilities over the course of a game in a different sport it might be still similar and so no. You know, I guess that's, you know, some of these are pretty decent examples of things that are pretty close to what you'd expect, but a little different. So here's re wheelchair athletes speed through longer distances. Wheelchair chair racers are held uh, wheelchair racers are held back in shorter distances because they take longer to get to full speed. So we've got wheelchair racers in pink and able-bodied in yellow. And we've got time on the sort of x-axis, got it like a distance on the y-axis, and there's a shape aesthetic for a categorical there and colors used. Um, but maybe this is pretty much iter is iter would be considered iteration on sort of common graphs that we're used to, but any comments on this one before we go? I know we're kind of at time here. Maybe um, this is our uh, facet. Uh, 
three facet or five thousand five um uh, five thousand what uh, eight hundred and a hundred with three values and the facet you can put them in one column mm. have three rows if you want to and then uh this is like simple what can be this like um geom point with different shapes no is this a lollipop chart kind of thing what which one is it lollipop chart i don't know which geom ah, the lollip yes 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 but they have they can they have different uh, uh ends as well um, i believe so yeah and with a dumbbell mm. dumbbell chart yeah yeah no but i like the the interesting part here is that uh they've used two two categorical variables one with color and shape so that's good and what is this facet thing on the side? I think the facet would be um, the distance variable. So in, in, the, name of, in the, the name of the, the axis. 100 million, uh, sorry, 100 meter race, 200 meter race, 400 meter race, then 800, 1500, 5000. Yeah. Uh, the right side seems empty or I don't know. Yeah, it is empty. Um, I, I, however, I don't know how, even if they are faceted, how are they, um, you know, non-uniformly on the different rows? So first row has three columns or, you know, three facet values. Second has two and then the last one has only one. So I don't know if cow plot allows that, um, something like that or M. That, um, um, you can do, when you do facet graph as well, you can do three... Um... Uh, three axis scales three scales oh. equal three so mm -hmm. you have the scale three and they can uh, have different values okay that's nice that's a nice one it's nice that you can add things uh, in here and then i found difficult uh positioning the uh, uh, arrows and mm. so the segments uh, with the curve and, and everything so you need to really like try an error to identify uh, the exact position what i might what i i was thinking about solving this issue uh, is to create like a sort of geom which makes like a, a grid of the plot. So you can identify uh, which uh, point is this. And so you can easily name it in your um, next ge geom. Maybe you can use this grid, geom grid or something like that uh, on purpose just to uh, position the, the curve and then you take it off. So I guess that would be something really uh, necessary to <laughs> important to have, yeah. Right. Yeah, when looking at a lot of these, I'm kind of like, oh, is this fascinating or, or this is really complex? And I'm like, oh, it's just it's just two graphs side by side. Like, so, you know, not that complex actually, but in a, in a kind of patchwork kind of a way, but yeah, this was a little, maybe a little more complex than that, but I know we should wrap up here. Yep, all right. Thank you so much, Michael, uh, for covering this chapter. I guess we do not have anyone, any volunteers for the next upcoming chapters. So um, I'll check with actually, Ken. Actually, I've set it up for, for the next one, which is... Oh, quite similar to the one that Michael just uh, talked about. There's a few mm -hmm. additions. So it will take like short than an hour. Okay. So that would be nice if it can, uh, maybe you can talk 
a bit about the things as a grid. Because it's quite shorter and mentioned a few things that Michael just mentioned today. So Okay. So are you suggesting that Michael takes it or you want to take it? No, I say I I will do You'll the take okay. I'll take sure. the chapter, but okay. maybe someone else can jump in and uh, I don't know, maybe share some uh, insights or experience because uh, it will be shorter than usual. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, I'll check with Kent. Um, so I, I like, like I requested him for a discussion. So if he thinks he wants to, you know, take um, like uh, if if his discussion might be as long as an hour, then we'll um, do either this chapter or uh, the discussion depending on his availability. If it's short enough, then we might be able to squeeze them both together next week. So we can do that, and I'll, I'll reach out to you, Federica. Then um, I'll, I'll let you know. Uh, I mean, we can discuss like when when it's most convenient or so next week. Let's let's go with next week with your chapter uh, for now, and um, I'll I'll reach back to you and Kent and, and figure out the final plan. Um, and if there are more people interested in the following chapters, um, you know, feel free to say that in the chat, like the, the book book club chapter chat or uh, personal message me. Anything would be fine. And uh, yeah. All right, so I think thank you again, Michael, and thank you everyone for coming in. Um, we'll see you all next week, same time. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thank you.